And that leaves me just to introduce uh, Professor Graham Hughes, who is our patron, inspiration, and our founder. And no, uh, no patient's day would be the same, Graham, unless you started it off. So we're delighted that you've agreed to do that today. And um, we look forward as ever to hearing what you have to say. Graham, I wonder if you could come up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estelle, for those kind words, and thank you all for coming. Um, the most important session, in many ways, is the question and answer session at the end. So I thought in my short talk I'd use it around uh, questions. So ten quick questions, some of which we can answer, some of which we can't. First of all, what is, what is Hughes syndrome? And there I know quite a number of new people here, so I apologize to those who, who know all these things. So this comes from a little booklet. Do you have any patients, doctor, with migraine and headache, with a DVT or a clot of any sort, with a current miscarriage, with memory loss, and with a tendency to young strokes, even TIA or transient ischemic attacks? And these are the features of Hughes syndrome. Um, 30 years ago, we gave it the name anti-cardiolipid syndrome, and then we changed it to anti-phospholipid syndrome. And the boffins, and you'll hear today, even that's the wrong name, strictly speaking. So sticky blood is what the media call it, and it's, it's kind of what's stuck. Main pointers, teenage migraine. Did you have migraine as a teenager? Yes, doctor, well, all my teenagers. It went away, but it came back later, and now it's a major problem. A tendency to clots, you don't have to have that tendency. We think that it's more sludging of the blood than clotting, but I'll come back to that because there are some doctors who say this patient can't have Hughes syndrome because she hasn't had a clot or a miscarriage. Um, recurrent miscarriage you'll be hearing about uh, in, in the next talk. And cold circulation, one of my patients calls it corned beef skin, is, is quite classical. How is it discovered? Well, it's 32 years ago <laughs> reported it. At, uh, first of all, a thing called the Heberden Society, which was in 1982. And we've been working in the world of lupus, which is a cousin of this syndrome, and uh, particularly interested in the brain and lupus, and things called antibodies that react with brain phospholipids. And bit by bit, we set up assays, and very clear, very quickly, and Estelle has told you about the large clinics. One of the virtues of large clinics is you see patterns of disease, and we saw this group of patients with what's now called phospholipid syndrome. So we described it in, in two British journals, the BMJ, and uh, those of you in the know know you can't get into American journals, so we published it in the, in the British Journal of Medicine, and this was uh, the same year, presentation both at the Heberden Society in 82 and at the Skin Society, that other features are headaches, epilepsy, Korea, that's a St. Vitus dance, multiple abortions, peripheral thrombosis, demyelination, that's a fancy word for MS or multiple sclerosis-like features in some patients. Bud Chiari, that's a name given to a clotting in the liver, which is rare, but we see it, uh, and other clots. So that's the syndrome. Many of you know only too well the features. Uh, bringing us up to the present, um, we're now into the, is it the... 13th, I can't read this, uh, international conference. And every two years or so, there's a world conference on Hughes syndrome. And this was the meeting arranged uh, a year and a half ago, uh, which a number of the colleagues here spoke at, run by two colleagues, Yehuda Schoenfeld on the right and Dr. Levy on the left. Uh, an outstanding meeting. And I want to show just a couple of slides from that. Here's one. In the Americans, there is a group led by a group in New York who are now trying to do what, what have been done here by your charity, and that is try and get some figures, because MPs, media, all want the figures. And although these are very crude, they, they are a sort of nice piece of work. For instance, if all patients with recurrent pregnancy loss, maybe 12%, we think more, are antiphospholipid positive. Strokes, I'm going to mention. Some causes, it's a cause of heart disease, and uh, something that I'm going to mention, DVT. What are the main symptoms? 
Well, this is a picture of a vein which looks lumpy and narrow in places, and this is a clot in the vein. Uh, funnily enough, it presents with a swollen arm, and in my textbook of medicine, which goes back a few years, it was ascribed to a tight pajama sleeve, which I think is rather, rather interesting. Um, the big story, of course, has been pregnancy, and you'll be hearing about that from Hannah Cohen next. Um, and it really has been a, a wonderful thing. Many of you know we have a, an annual meeting at St. Thomas's of mothers and babies, and um, they all come and have jelly and ice cream and vomiting and things like that. <laughs> pregnancy outcome has been dramatically increased, and I just want to show this to introduce the next talk. The brain seems to be particularly vulnerable to lack of oxygen or impaired oxygen supply. And the brain is stupid. You know, if it, if it gets not enough oxygen, then you get either headaches, memory loss, balance. And what we try and do is scan the brain. Uh, this is an MRI scan showing little white dots for those people who've had many clots. And for those who have severe cerebral features, severe headaches or balance, this should be done at some stage in the investigation. I mentioned migraine, common. Memory loss, common, very common. And a lot of our people don't come out with this until the doctor asks any problems in memory. Yes, you know, I'm the joke of the family. I, I can't remember um, which exit of the roundabout or, or I can't remember words. What are the tests? Uh, very simple, let's not make it complicated. There are two simple boxes that the GP must tick. And, and unfortunately, you need two. Um, and they are anticardiolipin, which is the main test. Some patients are negative on that test, and therefore you need another one with this terrible name, lupus anticoagulant. It's a historic name. And in the last decade, a new test for those other people who are negative, called beta-2, but that's that's small print for, for this meeting, I think. What is the treatment? Treatment, simply at the moment, is uh, either some way of keeping the blood flow better. And it, the choices, of course, are aspirin, heparin, and warfarin. And um, again, you'll be hearing about treatment uh, later on this morning. But I'd like to show one remarkable slide. This is really extremely interesting. For about a year, uh, we had at St. Thomas's a, a young registrar in psychiatry working in the unit, and David will remember that. And he was doing fancy memory tests, you know, one of these one-hour jobs where you remembered words and all the rest of it. And on the left is a young woman of about 40 with memory problems and Hughes syndrome, and she was down at the 13th percentile on his memory scale. She couldn't remember words. She had four weeks of heparin, which is a trial that we do in many patients to see whether we're on the right track. And there she is, 82% word finding. And our professor of psychiatry, who's very good, said there's no psychiatry drug that does anything near that. Are there any new drugs? Uh, yes, there are, and I'm going to pass on that one because you'll be hearing all about that uh, uh, this morning. A common question, of course, for us as doctors, what if the treatment doesn't seem to be working? I'm on warfarin, doctor, but I, I'm still getting headaches, balance is a problem, I, I'm not right. By far the commonest reason is very straightforward. If you look at that little yellow book of anticoagulant results, the thing called the INR, the, the thickness or thinness of the blood, in our patients often need a higher INR, and again, you'll hear about that in, and this cartoon really shows that if the blood thickening process drops, uh, then you get the syndromes. And I re think of it as Tesco's milk, normal milk, INR1, half cream milk, INR2, third. And we really need it to be in the three range. Does lifestyle, diet, uh, you know, going out in the sun, does, does that affect Hughes syndrome? It almost certainly does. And I just want to show one very interesting study carried out by a colleague of mine from India, New Delhi. He was the rheumatologist running the lupus clinic in New Delhi. And he went and worked for a year in Q8. And what he found was exactly the same frequency of antibody, anticardiolipin, in Q8 and in New Delhi. But the Arabic population in Q8 had twice the number of clots. And suggesting maybe that lifestyle diet, the more um, healthy diet, I, I guess, in, in uh, New Delhi contributed. Last but one, did, will my family get it? 
Now, many of you were here last year, and, we, and you kindly answered an anonymous questionnaire. And the question was, do you have a family history of autoimmune disease? And by that we mean thyroid, MS, rheumatoid, lupus, uh, or yeah, those. And patients in the audience, 60% had a, uh, a mother, aunt, sister with auto, uh, autoimmune syndrome, whereas their husbands or accompanying persons had a lower incidence. So the answer is yes. There is a genetic component if, if the doctor goes into it in detail. It may not be Hughes syndrome, but it could be, for instance, thyroid. Last question, very commonly asked, because of the confusion of the terminology, um, will I develop lupus? The answer is pretty well a resounding no. And this shows in, again, primitive form. It's very common uh, for the arrow to go one way. In other words, if you have a lupus clinic, one in five patients has got sticky blood. So it's definitely a small percentage of you in the audience who may have lupus will have this. But if you're a primary antiphospholipid and no evidence of lupus, the chances of developing lupus actually are very small, and this is now 32 years, more than 32 years on. But I'd like to end with this slide, really. This is the, what I call the big three. And doctors in the audience should know this. There are three things that go together like terrible triplets. Um, Hughes syndrome patients often get a lazy thyroid, and they often have accompanying Sjogren's. What is Sjogren's? Fibromyalgia, aches and pains, uh, fatigue, dry mouth, dry eyes. So that's not often asked about, but it's treatable with quinine. It's a very treatable thing, and I'm sure there'll be questions about this. So I want to end by showing, you know, we all write books, and we're given books by patients, and one of my patients gave me this, uh, Mills and Boone, you know, love stories, and this one is called um, Specialist in Love. Cheap, cheap books with lots of mistakes in them, and this, was, uh, this bit on the next page, if the machine works, was Fergus shook his head. No thanks, Jeff, he began to write in the patient's notes, Systemic lumpus erythematosus. In his untidy hand, he scrawled the inevitable sim symptoms, the outaneous signs, which included the well-known butterfly er erythema on the face, frontal alopecia, mucosal. He refrained from writing two words which this disorder signified potentially fatal. Well, that's the sort of stuff people are, are reading. My last patient is this young girl. I, I like to show her because she tells us such a story. She came over from Romania by train. It must have taken days. And she had a diagnosis of lupus. Uh, and her symptoms were of seizures, epilepsy, and memory problems. And they thought she had cerebral lupus, which is inflammation. And there you can see on grossly large steroid doses. She came over to us, and what she had was mini lupus, not much at all, but Hughes syndrome, sticky blood. And she is actually now perfectly well on warfarin, lifelong warfarin. This is about 25 years ago. And um, it shows the great importance to those of us dealing with connective tissue diseases to get the diagnosis right. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Estelle, for all your work and to Kate. <laughs>